All right. Praise the Lord. Good morning. Who's excited to be here this morning? Now, oh, come on now. Let's try this again. Who's excited to be here this morning? All right. Now, are you excited for the preaching or are you excited for the bounce house? Both. All right. Now, I appreciate your honesty. All right. Amen. Uh, who's excited for the pig picking? Who wants who wants to get in there and pick out some of those eyeballs and all that? Kind of, oh, no, I didn't want to ruin it for you. I want to thank Pastor Johnson for his friendship and for his faithfulness. And uh, like I said, if, if you need a Bible, get one. We're going to go to Haggai, Haggai, just like it says right here. Now, if you go to the New Testament, Matthew, and then just go back a little bit, you'll find Malachi, Zechariah, Haggai. So you're just going back three books. So go to Haggai. We're going to go to chapter one. I want to talk about this vision that Pastor Johnson has set forth for Jacksonville, North Carolina. He tells me when we speak, oh, you know, I'm in the big Jacksonville. And it's funny, but I really enjoy it because it just shows me that he's all in. He has a big vision for Jacksonville, North Carolina, and he wants to see God do a great work here. And I'm thankful for his preaching and his faithfulness. And uh, he mentioned my YouTube channel, and uh, sometimes that gets me in trouble. But I tell you, I had a call, a phone call on the way up here from a lady that said the church she was in told her that because she smokes that she can't go to heaven until she kicks smoking. And I told her that was a lie. Hey, when she gets to heaven, she might smell like smoke or smell like hell, but she won't go to hell because she believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, and she called to get her assurance, and she called on the name of the Lord. So I thank God for every opportunity that God gives us, but I'm especially thankful for the opportunity here this morning. And I want to share with you from Haggai about this vision. Uh, Malachi, if you could turn that down just a little bit. It's a little bit hot. I get a little, I want to get right up in the mic and hurt your ears, but I want you to hear what God has to say from Haggai. If we will look at verse number one. In the Bible, it reads, in the second year of Darius, the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai, the prophet, unto Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. So what happens? A man of God, a prophet, comes and he gives the vision to these two men. One is the governor. He's in charge of the politics. And the other was the high priest. He was in charge of of the church. Uh, verse 2, thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, this people say, the time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. He says, this is what's going on. This is what bothers God, is that the people say, don't go to church. Why are you worried about church? So the message is for the people. Look at verse 3. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, is it time for you O oh, ye to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste. Notice sealed. He's talking about having a ceiling over your head. He says, you go home, and you're building your house, and you're worried about everything you have at home, but you're not worried about the house of God. Verse 5. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Consider your ways your ways. Allow me to open up with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you so much and I'm thankful for everyone that's here this morning. Lord, I pray that you would give us an awesome day as we glorify you in all that we do. And Lord, right now I need your help. Lord, I ask that you would fill me with the Holy Spirit. I pray that you would magnify the scriptures. Lord, I pray that your spirit would prick the hearts of those that are not saved. And Lord, those that are, I pray that you would help them to consider their ways and build the house of the Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the people were not building the house of the Lord. They're not going to church. They're not worried about the fellowship. And he says, consider your ways. Now, consider your ways is kind of a, a big deal. If you were uh, to be pulled over by uh, an officer, which we have an officer this morning, and if she pulled me over and said, excuse me, sir, do you realize that this is a 55-mile-an-hour zone and you're going 90 miles an hour? You need to consider your speed limit, right? You kind of, you put it like, whoa, you need to slow down. Think about what you're doing. When somebody says, consider your ways, this is God saying you need to think about the direction that you're going because you're going the wrong way. Uh, you know, we've been in Jacksonville now for uh, six years down in Jacksonville, Florida, and we were praying for a miracle. We were praying that we were running out of room. We said, God, we need a building. We don't have enough money. We don't know how we're going to do it. We're asking for a miracle that only could be said that it was of God. And uh, well, one day I was sitting at the church building on a Wednesday and I get a phone call uh, from a lady that says, our church lost our pastor. We need a pastor. We want you to come take over our building, take over our church. And I said, wow, 
And then that night, Wednesday night, I share it with the church and a man was visiting and he said, you know, that was a really great story. You're talking about going and helping that church. And he said, that's why I'm here. Our pastor is quitting and we want you to come and take over our church. It happened two in one day. And I said, whoa, Lord, the Lord is doing something. It took some time, and he worked it out, and uh, we are Law of Liberty Baptist Church, and uh, we joined with a church that had been around for 50, 60 years. We have some members that have been there, literally one lady, been there 63 years in the church. It's been in three locations, and it's had four names, and it's had a dozen preachers, and I'm blessed to say that they asked me to be their preacher, and we've gathered together, and we're joined together, and we've strengthened the work in Jacksonville, Florida with what God is doing. It's an amazing thing, and it was one of those things just like, wow, the Lord is is doing something. Well, in this church where it is, it's on a road that people like to use as a racetrack out in the country. And we have a really nice big turnaround loop around the sign. And I mean, I'm telling you all the time, I see people turning around in front of the church. So I changed the sign uh, this past week and I put a good place to turn around. The good place to turn around. And listen, that's what this is. Temple Baptist Church, which that's what the name of our church used to be. Now it's Law of Liberty. Uh, it, this is a good place to turn around. I want to encourage you from the word of God this morning, consider your ways. Those that are not living for the Lord and considering God's will for their life, you're going to have problems in this life. And this is exactly because listen, it is time to build the house of the Lord. It is time for you to be in church. It is time for you to stop putting it off and saying, one day I'll get around to serving God and doing what he wants for me. No, now is the day. Today is the day. You need to listen to the Lord and do what he says. In Haggai, if you will, let's continue. Uh, let's look at uh, verse number six. Ye have sown much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it in a bag with holes. You know what that's saying? That's saying, that's saying there's too much month after the end of the paycheck. You know what I'm talking about? It's like money seems to run out before I get to the end of the month here. What's going on? God is trying to tell you uh, the, the blessings are not flowing because you haven't put church first. You haven't put God first, and therefore you try to gather, and it's just not enough. You try to eat, and you're still hungry. You're just not satisfied because you have not made God your number one priority. You know, we live in a time when the government wants to come in and say, whoa, shut your church down. You shouldn't be talking to people and breathing on people because of the cold, the flu, whatever, right? Uh, and, and what do they say? Well, leave the liquor store open, surely. And, you know, leave Walmart open and Home Depot and Lowe's. But we need to shut the churches down because that's the problem. We live in a time when your Christian faith is going to be tested, not just by peer pressure and the influence from your family members, but from the government itself. They're going to step in and try to tell you, sit down, shut shut up, go away, forget about church. I'm here to tell you, you personally, individually need to consider your ways. You have a personal choice. And I know maybe you're saying, I'm here because mama drugged me here. You know, or maybe you're saying, I'm not really into it, but you will answer yourself to God. You will stand before him one day and he will say, I told you, I called you, I drew you. I've told you the truth. The question is, how will you respond? Let's continue reading. Look at verse number seven. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house. And I will take pleasure in it. And I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Here's God's will, is that you would do your part to build this church. That means you need to be faithful to being here yourself. But that means you need to take it a step farther. And you need to bring somebody else to the house of the Lord to hear the preaching of the word of God. I'll tell you, there's a few preachers I listen to, and Pastor Johnson's one of them. Uh, we, we, now look, nobody agrees 100%. There's only been a few things that we disagreed on, and I, I repented, he gave me space for repentance, and I got it right, so you know it's all good. Now, I, I'm thankful that he's doctrinally sound, and he loves people, and he has a vision. He has a vision for Jacksonville, and it includes you, and it includes the lost, and it includes the brokenhearted, and he wants to restore people and build up people, and God is calling you today to build the house, Amen. to be part of this great vision. Look at verse number nine. You looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, it did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and you run every man into his own house. 
Therefore, the heaven under you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. God is saying, I've cursed your work. You understand what he's saying? God, where is it? It just seems like everything I do, I get back to square one, and I have nothing, and I'm just not satisfied with what the world has. It's because you have not considered your ways and built the house of the Lord. Look what he's telling them in verse number 11. This is so important. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands. He says, I've made a drought for the labor of your hands, so that there's not even work for you anymore. It got so bad here that they just did whatever they wanted and they disregarded the call of the Lord to gather together. And God said, I'm going to curse your rain. I'm going to curse your soil. I'm going to curse the fruit. I'm going to curse your drink. I'm going to curse your house. I'm going to curse your hands so you can't work. I'm going to curse the field so there's nothing for you to do until they would consider their ways. God has a specific purpose for everybody in here. I really believe that. He sets the members in the body as it pleases him. It's not how it pleases me, and it's not how it pleases your pastor here. It's how it pleases the Lord, and he brings us together for a greater vision, for a bigger purpose, and God has a perfect will for you. The question is, will you see it, and will you get a hold of it? Will you choose to obey the calling of the Lord? If you will, look at verse number 12. Then Jerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. In the words of Haggai, the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. Here, here's what's key. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth. You know what wisdom is? The beginning of wisdom is to fear the Lord. You haven't figured anything out in this world until you figure out that I need to be afraid of God and him first. And I need to respect him for everything above everything else. The problem is, is uh, we're afraid of, uh, of our boss at work. We're afraid of the economy or the stock market. We're afraid of that news anchor, which, by the way, it's not news. It's bad news. This is the good news. It's called the gospel. Everything else is bad news, and I don't want to hear it. I don't have time for it because they're fear-mongering, and they're lying, and they're deceiving, and they want you to be paralyzed by fear and not do anything for God. God's will is we would get in the good news first and forget about the liars on TV. He says, the people did fear before the Lord. If we would get this vision and start with the fear of the Lord and recognize that every one of you has an eternal soul and you will stand before the Lord at a judgment seat. And what will you say when you stand before the Lord? In fact, you won't stand, will you? You know what you're going to do? You're going to get down on your face and you're going to cry like a baby. And you say, oh, Lord God, have mercy, have mercy on me. There's no one that's going to stand before God and shake their fist or say, you didn't. No, 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 no. When we're in front of his presence, we're going to be humbled like a little child. God loves you. He's not willing that any should perish. Salvation is a free gift. Most don't know that. Verse 14, and the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. So this one man, Haggai, gets the vision from God. He preaches to the governor. He preaches to the priest. He preaches to the people. And God stirs them up. And they get busy. And they say, you know what? He's right. Let's get to work. Let's get on fire for God. Let's do something something for the Lord while there's still time. If you would, please go to Matthew chapter 16. I want you to understand that we are one body. We are one body in Christ. We're all built together. We're growing together. We learn from each other. We're here to help each other. Uh, I mean, this is really what the purpose of the church here. And I know there are people here for the first time today, and I just want to lay this vision out. I do believe that God wants you to be here in this local church to be part of this body. He uses the illustration of arms and hands and eyeballs. And if you say, well, I'm here and I like what I got, and thanks for the pig picking, but I don't know, that's too much work for me to get up on a Sunday and show up and show up and talk to people. It's like a body missing a hand or a head missing an eyeball. 
God has a will and he wants you here. He wants to help you grow and he wants you to help others to grow. We're here to be a help and an encouragement to other people. What did he say? He said, consider your ways. What did he say? He said, he said, uh, build the house. But then he said, I am with you. I want you to remember this. When you make a decision to fear the Lord, that God will go with you and he will guide you. He'll lead you. He'll comfort you. He'll give you all the direction that you need. Now, in Matthew chapter 16, uh, it, it talks about uh, the church. I want you to see this in Matthew 16. Look at verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So he says, Who do they say I am? Right? And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said, Who, what do people say about me? Well, they either think you was John the Baptist, same guy, or they think you're Elijah from the Old Testament or Jeremiah from the Old Testament. They don't know, right? But then he says, and he turns to them, and listen to me, this is for you. We all have to answer this question at some point in our life. Who do you say Jesus is? You know, the Muslims say that he was a good prophet. And if they don't repent of believing that, if they don't change their mind and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they will go to hell. The Jews say that he was a false prophet. The Muslims say he was a good prophet. If you're a born-again Christian, you say, he's not just a prophet. He's my Savior. He's my God. He died for all of my sins, right? Who do they say? Look what he says in verse 15. He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And that's my question to you. Who do you say that he is? Because if he's your Lord and your God, and he's calling you to build the house, consider your ways. Verse 16, and Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. What a great answer from, from Peter. Boy, I love Peter. He's got a lot of zeal. Even when he's wrong, he has a lot of zeal. I mean, he's been driving in the wrong direction. But what he's driving, he's not just pedaling around and wasting his time. He's like, go, 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 right? I mean, that's Peter. Look at verse 17. And Jesus answered and said, Blessed out thou, art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. He says that's not just a fleshly statement. That's a spiritual statement. You understand who God is, and God is a spirit. We must worship him in spirit and truth, and the Holy Spirit will work through you, and you call on the name of the Lord. You believe in him. He makes a home inside of you. And he says, that's good. You got it. That's a spiritual statement. It's a spiritual truth. But then look what he says in verse 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You know what that means? He's not saying the church is built on Peter. Peter means pebble. The Lord Jesus Christ is the rock. He's the foundation of our salvation. And he says that statement you made, that I am the Christ, that I am the Son of God, that is the foundation of the Christian church, and everything is built upon that. This is the new covenant that was happening as he's talking here, right? And, and he says the gates of hell shall not prevail. Now, the gates of hell, if they came to attack, uh, they would be stopped. But he's not saying that. And I know that the devil's attacking. I know it. But he's saying that they will not prevail when we attack them. I mean, what happened? We, you go to the flea market and you get souls saved. You go to the mall and you got souls saved. You go to Walmart and you're passing out flyers. That's illegal, brother. You're not allowed to do that, don't you know? Right? You say, no, I'm going to do what God has said and I'm not going to fear what men will do unto me. I'm here to serve the Lord Christ and we're here to call people under repentance to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our job. Most are afraid to do it. Most are afraid of man. They're afraid of what will happen if I just speak up. You know, I've discovered that there's too many opportunities out there, and it just seems that everywhere I go, when I do open my mouth, there's always somebody eager to listen. And it makes me wonder those times when I go somewhere and I don't open my mouth, did I just miss an opportunity for a blessing? I'll, I'll put my visitors on the spot. Rick. I asked them, I said, when's the last time you guys have been to an old-fashioned revival? Hey, and we're having a pig picking. And then I asked one of the kids, I said, when's the last time you've been in a bounce house? Let me tell you, church is special, isn't it? Amen. God is awesome. He has a plan for us. And here Jesus lays it out and he says, I'm going to build a church. It's based on the confession of trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. And the gates of hell will not run over us. They're not going to run us off. 
The problem is we get weak in the flesh and we give up. And I want to tell you right here this morning, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. And I want you to be a part of this church. And I want you to be a part of this big vision that your pastor has moving forward. He has a plan for 2024. And if you'll get on board, then when you get to heaven, the Lord Christ will say, well done, now good and faithful servant. Amen. God has a plan. Look at the next verse. This is important. So first Jesus says, I'll build my church. And here's the problem. Uh, and I'm, I, I have a church in Jacksonville. And there are days I feel like I, I need to build it. I need to go do something. But it doesn't work that way. You know, the church is, is not the walls. Tomorrow morning, Monday, there's no Holy Spirit in these walls. The church, the word church means the gathering, the, uh, uh, the congregation, the assembly when people are gathered together with the Holy Spirit inside of them, the church, although we meet in a building and there's nothing wrong with that, the church is the people that come together to help each other, to encourage each other, to seek after the Lord, right? And so he says, my church, he says, hell can't stop it. And I'm going to build my church is what Jesus said. But then look what he tells us to do. He gives us a job. Look at the next verse, verse 19. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven... Now, wait a minute. You know, Jesus has a key ring, and there's a bunch of keys on it. One of them is the key to heaven. Now, I got here early, and the door's locked. I couldn't get in. What do I do? I don't have the key. I don't have access, right? Now, think about this. Jesus has the key to heaven, and he says, you're part of my church. He says, I'm going to give you the key. If you're saved, God's giving you the key. When we needed in the door, Pastor Johnson was here. He had the key. He opened the door and let us in. If you're saved and you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, He says, I'm going to give you the key to salvation, the key to heaven, and the goal is you would open that door for somebody else. What He's talking about here is Jesus is going to build the church, but He wants us to build heaven by preaching the gospel. Look at what He says here in verse 19. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I want you to go to John chapter 20 with me. Go to John chapter number 20. Jesus said, I'm giving you the key. You can open the door to salvation. You can make the way known to everybody. You can grant access because Jesus has died for the sins of the whole world. He says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a totally free gift. He says just take the gift and give it away. Give it to somebody that needs forgiveness of sins. It's totally free. You don't have to come down to an altar. You don't have to say a special prayer. You don't have to change your life and turn it around. You don't have to come to church every time the doors are open. No, it's in your heart you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's his promise. And he says, I'm giving you that key and I want you to open that door for somebody else. Jesus said, I'll build my church. Don't worry about who shows up here. He says, I'll build the church, but I want you to build the kingdom. I want you to build heaven. And he says, whoever you let loose on earth, I'll let them loose in heaven. What a beautiful promise. In John chapter 20, where you're at, this was the very day that Jesus had resurrected. And at first he said, touch me not. I've not yet ascended to my father. He told that. And he says, but go tell your brethren. And he meets them. And I want you to pick up with me in verse number 21. John chapter 20, verse number 21. Then said Jesus to them again, peace be unto you. As my father hath sent me, even so send I you. Now think about it. What's my purpose on this earth? Well, just like the Father sent the Son to save the world. Now Jesus says, okay, you believe on me, you're saved. Now I'm going to send you with that same mission, same purpose, but here's the cool thing, and with the same power and the same authority. Look at the next verse, verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. This was the very day that Jesus resurrected from the grave, and He delivered to His disciples the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He gave them great power to preach in His name and set the captives free, to deliver the dead souls, hey, the keys to heaven, and open that door and say, Now go preach, just as I did. Look what He says. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Verse 23, Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, 
they are retained. You know, a remittance and a retainer, these are lawyer terms. And I, I'm not a lawyer. There's one next door if you need one, right? Uh, you say, lawyer, I got, I got no speeding ticket. I need some help. He says, give me a retainer and I'll help you. That's give me some money in a sense. And I'll, now I, I work for you. And right now Jesus says, whosoever sins ye remit, that means they're wiped out. When I get my power bill at the bottom, it says a remittance. This is a technical accounting term. Tear off the remittance, put in your payment, send it to them. It's paid. He says, whosoever sins, you tell that they're paid for. They're paid because Jesus already paid for them all. But whosoever sins you retain, they're retained. He said, you preach the gospel to somebody and they say, I'm just not ready to believe in Jesus. Don't you know? I'm so distracted by what I see on TikTok and Instagram and YouTube and Facebook and I'm following the world and I want to look like them and I want to be popular like them and I want to live like them. And woo! He says, listen, if you don't choose Jesus, you're going to retain your sins. You know what it means to retain water? That means you don't let it go. That's no fun, right? Now think about it. He says, if you tell somebody, listen, Jesus paid for it all. And they say, ah, I'm not interested. You say, well, then you are keeping your sins and that will send you to hell. Amen. What a bold proclamation. If you would go to Luke chapter 14, please. Go to Luke chapter 14. He's given us the same power that he had that was given to him by the Father he wants us to go out and deliver souls. He said, build the house and I'll be with you. He said, consider your ways. And this is a great place to do that, to consider your ways. This is a great place to turn around. This is a great place to build the house for the Lord. And it's not that there's a whole lot of handyman work around here. It's that God wants you to go out and call souls to him. And if you say, I don't know how to preach the gospel, I say, well, come with me. I'll show, I'll show you my zeal for the Lord. Come with me and be my silent partner. We've got instructionals on how to do it. I'm I mean, we do soul winning on Saturday. Come and see and learn. Just be a silent partner and sit. And I'll say, okay, now go to Romans chapter 3. And I'll look at you. And you turn there as I'm talking to somebody preaching the God. Now go to Romans chapter 6. And now go over here. Go over there. And you can learn how to preach the gospel. Pastor Johnson has a great little system with his notebook. and made it super simple. I encourage you to memorize it. Learn it for yourself. And then you know what, Mom? Hey, get your kids saved, right? Dad, now get your kids saved. Get your neighbors saved. Get your parents saved. If, if you know somebody that's lost and on their way to hell, you have the keys of heaven and hell. And you can open up that door of eternal life. In Luke chapter 14, and I'll be brief because I, I know I'm sure that pig's smelling good. That bounce house is fully inflated, right? I told Pastor Johnson, I'm going to go out there and do a couple flips in the bounce house before we sang. So I was pumped up and excited. So <laughs> uh, I want you to see this in Luke 14. Again, Jesus, he gives us a great vision here, a great illustration. And in Luke 14, look at verse 23. And the Lord said unto the servant, go. Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Hey, guys, I've got something for you to do. It's called go. Doesn't that sound like the Great Commission? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. God has something for you to do. It's to get somebody else saved. God has something for you to do. It's to invite your friend that goes to church elsewhere and say, no, 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 come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. Come and build the temple, build the house of the Lord. Let's do it together. He says, go. And you know what that means? We call it soul winning, right? Proverbs 11, 30, he that winneth souls is wise. I'd rather pull them out of the fire than to see somebody go to hell. He says, therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. You can call it evangelism. Uh, we call it preaching the gospel, the, the good news. Notice he says, he says, go out. So that's not just sit here, or worse than that, sit at home. Oh, do you guys go to church? Oh, we watch online sometimes, kind of, maybe, maybe not. Let's be real. COVID is the universal excuse to be lazy, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, anybody that didn't want to go to work, you say, oh, 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 don't come in. Oh, we'll pay you to stay at home and not work, right? All the more for church. God says build the house. He says consider your way. The government says don't come to church. And you're already looking for an excuse anyway to be lazy and sit on your tail and watch some television. God wants you to go. God wants you to go out. God wants you to build his house. 
Let's not listen to the excuses of the world. Get up and go out and be part of what God is doing. He says, go out. But then he says, out into the highways and hedges. Now, this is interesting because a highway is literally a tall road. I mean, it's what it means, what it sounds like. It's high roads in between cities, the outlying areas, right? And then he says, in the hedges. Now, a hedge is a wall of protection or a wall of bushes. Or you guys got those needlepoint hollies up here? Boy, those things are a bear once you get in. I mean, you know what I'm talking about? Like, you could put it around your window, and somebody's not going to climb in the window. And he says, I want you to go to the tall roads, and I want you to go to down where those hedges are, even the sharp ones, and I want you to bring people to me. What he's saying is, don't just go where it's comfortable. Don't just invite your peers. Invite those that are below you and invite those that are above you. He says, invite everyone to God's house. It amazes me how many times people that you think, well, surely they wouldn't be interested in church. And then you follow the leading of the Holy Spirit and you open your mouth and they're the most interested. You're not going to believe it. I was just looking for a good church. It happens all the time. So he says, go out into the highways and the hedges. And then he says, and compel them. And compel them to come in. Compel is a very strong word. Here's another synonym from the Bible. It's, it says persuade. Persuade. Or here's another one. To convince. Or to exhort. Or to encourage. Or to motivate. Or to invite. Or to challenge. I was challenging Malachi. I'm talking to him about his doctrine. I'm talking about his soul. And, he, and I'm trying to provoke him a little bit. I'm trying to tell him, hey, hey, step it up a notch. Step it up a notch. You can do this. If God is with you, you have nothing to be afraid of. And I say the same thing to you. I want to compel you not just to come today, but to stay and be a big part of this. You want, you want God's blessing on your life? Remember what he said to Malachi? You, put, you earn wages to put it in bags with holes. I just earned all this money and it's, whew, it's gone already. I'm already broke. You want God's blessing on your life? Build the house. Put Him first. Show Him that you're willing to submit and sacrifice and serve and help others. And when He sees you helping others, then He will help you. Pastor, you just don't understand what's going on with my industry and how things are at my work and the company up the road, they did this to us and I don't know what we're going to do. And if I don't get out there and work on Sunday and get that overtime, we're just not going to eat. I don't believe it, not for one second. That's a lie from the devil. Let me tell you this. You take a stand. You stand on the Bible. You stay, hey, I'm going to live for the Lord Jesus Christ and I'm not going to lose my integrity. I'm not going to lose my Sundays to working. I'm not going to lose my family to the devil. We're going to church. And if you're going to fire me over it, that's okay. Because I believe that's God closing one door so he can open a greater door. And if I just follow him, he'll bless me. He'll take care of the rest. Amen. I really believe it. I've seen it. Amen. Compel them. Exhort them. Convert them. Tell them the truth. Get them on fire. Compel them. Look what he says in verse 23. That my house may be filled. That my house may be filled. You know, I, I know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I know that God has a house in heaven. And my Father's house are many mansions. It's like, well, there's the Spirit. And I'm the house. And there's the one in heaven. That's a house. And yet God works today through a local congregation. We are called to gather together and exhort one another. And so much the more as we see the day approaching. And I mean, anybody seeing the day approaching lately? Does it look, is it getting a little weirder and weirder out there? Or is it just me? Compel them to come in that my house may be filled. This is a commandment from the Lord. And if you obey it, I promise you, God will bless you. God will bless you. In 1 Timothy 3, he says, he says that the church of the living God, he says it is the pillar and the ground of truth. This is the place we get our truth. It's not CNN or Fox News. It's not even the alternative media. Oh, I got this special guy who does I got this Facebook group. I got, no, no, no. This is the truth. He says the pillar holding up the house and the ground, the foundation of the truth. He says, hey, you're the boots on the ground locally when you gather together in a local church. Church is for discipleship. 
Church is for learning God's word. Church is for worshiping him through songs, right? Uh, hey, church is also for uh, accountability. Hey, brother, where you been? I sure didn't miss you. How's that thing you asked me to pray for? How, how's things going? Because I'm still praying for you. We need accountability. We need prayer partners. The church is for serving others. It's for equipping the saints to go out and to evangelize a lost world. Church is for healing the brokenhearted and healing families, praying for each other. Who do we invite to church? Well, brother, we're, we're kind of a nice church. We don't just want anybody coming in here. I mean, first you give them the smell. They smell good, you know what I mean? Now listen, I tell people all the time, you don't have to dress like me to come to church. I wear a suit and a tie when I go to church because that's what I wore. The last time I had to go apply for a job, I still have that job. I work a full-time job. I got four kids. And I preach four times a week. I'm out of time. I don't have any free time. But the last time I had to go apply for a job, this is how I dressed. I presented myself the best way that a businessman would. Now, uh, you know, when I have a day off, I don't dress like this. When I'm working in the garden with the chickens, I'm not dressed like this. But I just want you to understand, when I come to the house of the Lord, I just bring my best because I'm here to represent the Lord Christ. And if he's given me things and I want to do the best, I bring my best to the house of the Lord, not my last and not my least. But I, I welcome people. Uh, come in your shorts and your flip-flops and that raggedy old T-shirt. That's okay. Just come. Make it a priority because God sees your heart, not your outward appearance. And, I mean, there are guys that, you know, I mean, they step outside of church and they go smoke a cigarette. And you know what? I'm not going to go preach a sermon against them and get the, oh, that guy that smokes. We're really going to get that guy. Man, God forbid I would offend one of his children that's coming and trying to draw close that wants to grow. Look, I'm not talking about compromising on, on sin. But who do you invite to church? People that need Christ. Yeah, that's good. Those that want to draw nigh unto the Lord. Once he say, draw nigh unto me, and I will draw nigh unto you. That's his promise. If you will, look at verse 20, uh, 12. Who do we invite to church? Verse 12. Then said he also unto him that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, nor thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again and recompense be made to thee. He says, when you're throwing a big party, hey, we got the whole hog pig picking out here, right? He says, don't just call your rich buddies because, you know, they'll invite you back to their party. That's not what God wants us to do. No, no, no. Oh, they got to look just like us. No, no, no. Verse 13, but when thou makest a feast, call the poor and the maimed and the lame. And the blind. Do you know what maimed means? That means you're missing something. Do you know what lame means? That means it hurts when you walk. He says, call those that are hurting. You know how great of a blessing it is to feed somebody that's hungry? Now, go give a plate of food to your rich buddy. Ah, what is it, barbecue? We'll go downtown if we want barbecue. No, not in God's house. He says, call everybody, feed everybody. He says, call the hurting people and help them. Verse 14, and thou shalt be blessed. He says, you help somebody that can't help themselves and God will really bless you. In fact, I know Pastor Johnson will back me up on this. Hey, y'all have some neighbors. Maybe you say, I I'm here for a little bit and I'll take some plate, you know, but I let take a plate home with you and you tell them it came from this church and you say, and they say, thank you. You say, God bless you. Say, give God the glory. I mean, take some food, feed the people that need it. You know, somebody that needs a plate, Take two. Amen? Let's feed people. Let's, let's help people. And he's talking about spiritual help too. He says, verse 14, And thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed as at the resurrection of the just. He says, you do well with what I've given you. You're a good steward of the money I gave you while you're here, and you use it to help people that are asking God for help. You're an answer to their prayer. He says, you have a big reward in heaven at the resurrection, right? Verse 15, And when one of them that sat at meat heard these things, he said unto them, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many. That means he invited a bunch of people. And he sent his servant at supper time. Now, now I, I'm not in the south anymore, am I? I'm in, I'm in the north, all right? North Carolina, is that right? Across that line? It's, okay, all right, thank you, all right. What time is dinner time around here? Five o'clock. Usually six o'clock for me when I get home. I ask my wife, can we eat at six as soon as I get off? Because I'm starving by the time I get home, right? So five, six o'clock, that's dinner time, right? Now what time does it get dark around here? 
7, 7.30. All right, so you eat, and about the time you're probably done, it's, it's dark, right? So let's remember that as we read these next few verses. He says in verse 17, And he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. Hey, come on, the food's ready, the bounce house is ready, we got drinks, we got coffee, we got water, we got donuts, man, we got it all, get in here. But they weren't interested. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. Here's the problem. We're talking about building the house of the Lord. But they said, is it time to build the house of the Lord? And they go back and they're dwelling in their sealed houses. Oh, I can't come to church this morning. I'm working on my driveway. Oh, don't you know, it's time for new shrubs. If we don't pressure wash it on Sunday, it's going to be ugly Monday morning. Right? They're working on their house, but they won't come to God's. He says, with one consent, they all began to make excuses. I'm gonna, I, want, I just want to ask the Lord to convict you guys right now. Please don't make excuses for not coming to church. Won't you let the Lord work in your heart? They began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go see it. I pray thee, have me excused. Here's the property investor. Oh, I bought some property recently, and I haven't even looked at it yet. Uh, now that it's dinner time and it's about to be dark, I need to go look at it. Wait, you're buying property without looking at it? You're going to go look at dark? That's not a very good excuse, is it? I mean, how many of you guys know a realtor that would just buy something sight unseen? And then when you invite them to church, all that, well, don't you know being a realtor Sunday is really the day? I mean, if you're not available on Sunday, you might as well not even be a realtor, right? If being a realtor is going to keep you from building the kingdom of God, you better find another career. I got a 6 p.m. inspection. It's dinner time. Give me a break. Right? <laughs> Look at verse 19. And another said, I have bought five yoken of oxen. Now, that's a lot of ox. These are bulls, right? A yoke is a pair. I bought 10 of them. Now, look what he's saying. Verse 19, and I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray they have me excused. Now, we don't ride oxen anymore around here. We, we drive trucks, right? Well, I just bought a brand new truck, and I got to go take it for a test drive. You already bought it? And now at dinner time? It's, church, it's Sunday. I got to go get that new tractor on Sunday because tractor supply is open. I can't, I can't be bothered with church. I need a new lawnmower. The excuses never really change. I got this new truck, and I've got to take it for a night ride as soon as I see it for the first time. Really? Sunday, verse 20, and another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot afford to come. I'm sorry, that's not what it says, is it? Did, did I add to that? Well, let's try that again. Uh, who's paying attention? Verse 20, another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. I just got married, so I can't go to church. Listen, this is a warning for all of you that are not married. Be very careful who you marry. You say, oh, I'm newlywed. I just fell in love and I found the love of my life. And they don't really have church and God as a priority. So, you know, Sunday they wanted to go do this or go do that. I got to take my wife shopping. Be very, very careful who you marry. I know there's a few of us in here going to say, hey, amen. Let me tell you a story about somebody that didn't, they weren't very careful. And they messed up and boy, it still hurts them today. You that are unmarried, I encourage you, marry a Christian. Somebody that's on fire for God. Somebody that has character and integrity. And they want to love you and take care of you and be with you. And they're ready to lay their life down for you just as Christ did. I mean, that's what the Bible teaches. You're in a family-focused church. And there's preaching about the family every week. How to make the family get closer to God. And how everybody has their part. This is the vision. But you get somebody that doesn't have that vision. And they're more worried about taking a picture with you on Instagram so they can show you off. And then maybe in a few more weeks, they're done with you and they're moving on to something else. Be, care be very careful who you marry. The Bible tells us biblical, biblical roles. First of all, there's only two genders. There's only two genders. Man and woman. That's how he created in the beginning. The man is supposed to lead. The man is supposed to get up and go out and work and teach, and the buck stops with the buck. Dad, if something's wrong in the family, it's your fault. It's because you're dropping the ball. Mom is 
there to be a helper and to submit and to serve and to train up the kids. The Bible talks about being a keeper at home. That is not a housekeeper. You can hire a Consuela to be your housekeeper. That's not what your wife is. When it says keeper at home, that means the standard that dad has set. Dad says, we're going to honor the Lord. We're going we're gonna to do what God says. We're going to be honest and we're going to just take care of business. We're going to train up the children in the fear of the Lord. And they need to read the Bible every day. Whatever those standards dad begins to set, mom keeps those standards. When it says that a woman is the keeper at home. Now, who's ever watched soccer? You know what they call the goalie or hockey? What do they call the goalie? The goalkeeper. In the Bible, it uses this phrase that there was the keeper of the wardrobe. There was the keeper of the treasure. You, you kept a field. That's a guard. Mom, you're the guard at home to guard the children when dad, the shepherd, is out. And unfortunately, we live in a time when too many dads become narcissistic and they do it their own way and they go against God's will. What's it say? Smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. It's a sad thing when it happens. God does have a plan. There are gender roles and even kids. You know, you know the Bible says for you kids? Who can quote... Who can quote Ephesians 6 1 for me? Any takers? Put somebody on the spot. Put this guy on the spot. Children, oh, obey. What's it saying? Children, obey. For this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother. You know, we've lost it where we don't honor our parents anymore. We don't take care of our parents. We're not doing what's right. Now, God's will is that you would obey mom because mom is in charge. Did she get it? Awesome. Good girl. Good job. Amen. That's encouraging. Listen, there's a generation out here. They're not like the rest of them. They want to get close to the Lord. They want to consider their ways. They want to build the house of the Lord. They want to honor their parents, even when it's not easy and it's not fun. It takes work, but who pays you when you do good work? The Lord will reward you. Amen. The Lord will reward you. I want to encourage you guys in this. Listen, God has roles. He has a plan. Look at verse 21. Look at God's response here. Luke 14, verse 21. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, the blind. He says, go out what's easy to reach. Go to those that are hurting and bring them in. Bring in the humble people that want to get close to God. Bring in the hungry and the hurting so they can get close to God and His Word. That's what church is for. Verse 22, and the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. Lord, we've done it. We went out. We went out. We went out. And there's still some room for more people to be fed spiritually and physically. Church is a place of healing, helping, and there's a lot of hurting people out there. Look at verse 23. This is where we started in Luke 14. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. If you will go back to Haggai, and we're going to finish there. We're going to look at one last thing in Haggai. Where we started, Haggai chapter 1. God's will is that you would go out and compel them that his house would be filled and he has a plan and you're part of it. You're one of the puzzle pieces in that huge picture that he has. Hey, next Sunday is Bring a Friend Sunday. And we're going to we're going to double yourself. You're supposed to spiritually reproduce yourself. So next Sunday, I want you back here and I I want you to bring a friend and I promise you that God will bless you and he will begin to multiply your blessings in your life. You say, oh, I just, you don't understand. I need some help. I know. I know. And what he's saying, build the house, build the house and I'll reverse the curse. I'll bless you for your time. I believe that when the Lord sees us reaching the hurting, the strangers and filling this place, he'll see our work and he'll supply all of our needs. He'll take care. He'll patch the hole in your account. All that money that's just, I don't know why, it just keep costing more and costing more. Don't worry. The Lord will take care of you when you work for him and build his house. Haggai chapter one. Let's finish here. Look at verse number two. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, in this house lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider 
your ways. I want you to think about the direction you've been going, and I want to give you a chance to turn it around right here. Amen. Consider your ways. Start working for the Lord while there's time. And when you stand before him, you won't have to be ashamed. Amen. Verse 6, you have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, and there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it in a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain, and bring wood, and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Listen, I want you to give God glory in your life. When you work for the Lord and you build this local church, God will be glorified and he will bless you. He said, I will take pleasure in it and I will be glorified. The one thing that Pastor Johnson, he said it so well. What he didn't know is I was praying it as he said it. And I was just like, okay, Lord, that's you. I'm here in Jacksonville, North Carolina today, not to give Adam Fannin the glory. And not to give Pastor Johnson the glory. I'm here to give the Lord Jesus Christ the glory. And when you walk out of here today, I want you to say, now those are true Bible-believing Christians. They lay down their life. They're serving people. They're loving. They care about me. They want to help me. Like, that's what a Christian ought to be. We're living as Christ has told us to. Will you come with me and see my zeal for the Lord? Guys, I wish I could be here next week, and I won't, but I want to ask you to commit. Will you build this house? Will you walk in the fear of the Lord? Amen. He said in verse 13, at the end of it, he said, I am with you, saith the Lord. Amen. God will draw nigh unto you, and thank God we don't have to be perfect. Sinlessly perfect is impossible. He says, you draw nigh unto me, and I will draw nigh unto you. This is a good place to turn things around, isn't it? Amen. Consider your ways. And help build the house of the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just ask that you would use these words to stir us up, Lord. Oh, Lord God, I thank you for the gift of salvation and the gift of forgiveness of sins. And I just ask that today you would get all the glory from everything that happens. Lord, I pray that you would bless the food that we're about to eat. I pray that you would uh, give us the strength to serve you better. Lord, I pray that you would help us to not be selfish and learn to serve one another. Lord, I ask that you would do a miraculous work here and build this house and double this house. We ask this in Jesus' name.